Hey everyone, in today's video, I'm going to be talking about two new Canadian dividend stocks that I added to my stock portfolio here today. We're going to start by going through what these companies are before going into some of their stock trends over the last year or so. And then we're going to get into some of their investor relations reports, um, their business models and their valuations before finishing off on why I think right now is a good time to be buying each of these stocks in my opinion. So if you like this kind of content, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. And with that, we'll just jump right into it. You can see here the first stock on the screen is Rogers Communications. Rogers Communications is a telecom company in Canada. They serve customers coast to coast with services like internet, cable, cell phone plans, and they also dabble in some other things like home security, but those are pretty minor and just to kind of package all their services together. You can see here the stock went on a pretty good tear going up from the low 50s all the way up to almost $70 a share, and that was really behind excitement on their Shaw Communications merger that went into place earlier this year. But since then, the company's just been an absolute free fall. A couple of reasons why that we'll talk throughout this video in my opinion. But ultimately, the company right now is trading at almost a 4% dividend yield, $27 billion market valuation, right at their 52-week low, give or take. So that was kind of enticing from the get-go for me to look into this company um, a bit more. Going into their business, the largest part of their business is their wireless division. So they have the largest um, wireless division in Canada, even bigger than Bell. Uh, very lucrative business, lots of people with phone plans across the country um, that really require them. And it's a, a great recurring stream of revenue uh, for the company. You can see here they have over 11 million mobile phone subscribers, which is huge if you just think about um, the size of the country and, and the market share that they have there. That means they have over 11 million people paying them over 50 bucks a month for essentially an essential service in their life. And it's really profitable to over 60% EBITDA margins on that revenue. So first and foremost, there may be some upcoming weaknesses in some other divisions, most notably cable, but I really like how this is the cash cow of the business. It's definitely a really strong economics business and they have a very large presence there. So I really like that cash cow that they have going for them. Going on into their cable business, they recently just acquired Shaw, which has about the same size cable business as them. You can see kind of their footprints coast to coast. So Shaw's really big out west. Rogers is really big out east and in Ontario. So it was a really good merger from that sense for, for the cable division. And they can really start synergizing back end costs, um, not making duplicative um, investments in content and whatnot, uh, using the channels that they already have out east to serve customers out west. Uh, so there's lots of synergies on the back end to make this division a lot more profitable in the years to come. So that was a great um, acquisition there to just get themselves more of a national footprint on some of these categories, including cable. Continuing on here, one of the things I really like about uh, Rogers is their ownership and their investments in live sports and media assets. So you can see they um, own the Toronto Blue Jays outright. They also have about a 40% stake in Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment, which owns the Toronto Maple Leafs, Toronto Raptors, in addition to just the value of these teams being very high um, because there's a lot of scarcity involved uh, with the amount of them that are out there. It also puts them in a really strong position to own media rights. Obviously, with the Toronto Blue Jays, they're the exclusive provider of, of their games on their Sportsnet channels. Um, and sport, live sports is really sticky. And as cable may face some weakness in the years and decade to come, I think in the Canadian landscape, their investment and ownership in live sports will kind of ensure that they are not declining or they're holding up better than whatever other competitors that are out there. And even if cable does go down and down and down, these live sports assets will still have a lot of value, whether it's uh, selling streaming or doing their own streaming. They're currently doing like a Sportsnet Plus package for people to stream games already. So that could still be the future that slowly grows as cable may decline. Going into some of their revenues here. So you can kind of see here the cable revenue um, from that acquisition that they did with Shaw. It's up about 100%. So they doubled their cable business with that acquisition. Uh, EBITDA margins only up 1%, 100 basis points so far, 
But in the years to come, as they really synergize that back end, I expect this to go up exponentially. Even if they can get from 50 points of margin to 55 points of margin, on a $2 billion business, that's an extra $100 million of cash flow flowing to the bottom line. Some of their other business units here, you see wireless organically growing really nicely, about 7% on top line, 10% on EBITDA, um, a bit of an increase in churn, which isn't great to see, uh, but still very low overall. And then ARPU is just the average revenue per user. That's been under some pressure over the last few years, uh, just with lots of regulation and, and government intervention to make sure um, these kinds of companies are not overcharging consumers. But long term, I think that they have a lot of pricing power and they'll continue to provide better service like with 5G and whatnot, which will drive up um, the ARPUs as well as they deliver more value to their customers. Media, for the most part, is being almost served as a bit of a, uh, I don't want to say loss leader because they're not necessarily losing money, but it's really feeding that cable network and feeding some of their other businesses. So you see here about 700 million in the quarter, but they only made a few million dollars in um, profit there. Going into their balance sheet. And I think this is one of the reasons the companies traded off so much just with their debt load that they have, given how high interest rates are. The Shaw acquisition was also primarily done via debt as well, um, which probably wasn't great timing given what's happened with interest rates since that deal's gotten announced. But what I kind of look at is just for um, kind of quarter over quarter, year over year improvements on these companies that are heavily capitalized uh, and have very big um, debt loads. And, you know, when you're talking about companies like telecommunication companies, like REITs, like utility companies, they typically do have a lot of debt because it costs a lot of money to build out their system. And then they leverage that system to drive earnings and, and profit to help pay off that debt over a long period of time. So it's not abnormal to see debt loads on companies like this. And it's really hard to kind of give uh, a read right now on their current position. Because yeah, they grew their debt $13 billion, but they also bought Shaw, which was over a $20 billion acquisition. So I don't want to give them necessarily a free pass. This is still something as an investor, um, I'm going to be watching really carefully and I want them to be improving over time. Um, but it's definitely um, not an apples to apples comparison year over year on this name. And if we look at some of their other um, components of their balance sheet here too, their total assets went up about $15 billion. But that's also maybe not a fair um, analysis just because lots of that was in goodwill. You see $4 billion to $16 billion, and goodwill doesn't really provide too much value. It's just uh, the premiums that they paid for, for Shaw Communication. So this one is hard to kind of check. Overall, it looks like they have a lot of debt, but they've been able to cover it and pay off debt over the last few quarters, looking for that to continue quarter over quarter, and that will be um, kind of an essential uh, component of continuing to buy this stock. I want to make sure they're not getting themselves in a position like AT&T or some of these other telecommunication stocks in the U.S. have gotten themselves in with just such high debt loads and dividend payouts that they don't have enough cash flow to operate the business. So with the sell-off, this company right now is trading at about 50 bucks a share and they're expected to do $5.20 of earnings per share next year. $4.40 this year. So they're trading about 12 times current year earnings, which is wrapping up, and under 10 times next year's earnings. So my hypothesis and the reason I'm buying this company is, first of all, I just think for a company like Rogers, who's been around for decades, is in a really defensible space in the economy. Not many people in a recession are going to cancel their cell phone plans, cancel their internet. Um, I think they're in a, in a decent spot for the valuation that they're at. So a couple of things I think can help grow this company. One is population growth in Canada. We have lots of immigration growth coming to Canada, lots of new international students coming to Canada. We do have some underlying issues pertaining to this, like housing and whatnot. But for companies like Rogers, who really is serving the entire population, that's definitely a tailwind on their business. The second thing is synergies from the Shaw acquisition. We just saw the very beginning of it with some of the cable synergies, but that's going to continue to grow over the next 12 to 24 months to expand uh, margins and expand profitability. I think through those two things, trading at under a 10 times next year's earnings, they have a lot of tailwinds to even drive higher earnings per share in 2025, 2026. Um, so I think that 
This is just a great value here at under 10 times earnings for a quality company like this in a space that isn't really discretionary. Lots of people that use their services truly require and, and need these services in their life, no matter what um, kind of economic hardships get thrown their way. The second stock that I bought here today was RioCan. So RioCan is a retail REIT um, that operates across Canada, primarily in major cities. Doing a quick check on their value here, trading at a 6.4% dividend yield. In the last one year, the stock has gone from $23 down to $17 um, at the lows here today. So they're, that's like a dip of almost 30% on RioCan so far this year. Looking at their business a bit, they operate primarily in the large cities. So about 90% of their business is in the largest six cities in Canada. They really like that concentration in urban centers that they feel like will grow quicker than the rest of Canada. And they have over a 97% occupancy rate. So this isn't necessarily your retail on the side of the road in a random city that's been empty for five years or anything like that. They have a couple hundred properties across these six cities. If we look at kind of their tenant base here, you can get a sense that they're really meticulous about who they rent to um, and really positioning themselves to minimize the cyclicality of their retail operations. So 20% of the business is in grocery and liquor, 15% in essential services. Think um, like doctors, dentists, um, hairdressers and stuff like that too. Specialty retailers like Dollarama, Canadian Tire, um, actually value retailers is probably Dollarama, but specialty retailers is probably businesses like Canadian Tire, Home Depot, and then value retailers like Dollarama and whatnot. You can kind of see some of their other um, exposure here. They do have some um, maybe headwinds, let's call it, with like department stores, movie theaters. But all in all, this is a very manageable part of their portfolio today. Um, and they tend to collect almost 100% of their rent on a monthly basis. Going into their occupancy, they've been pretty stable here. It dipped a bit during 2020 for obvious reasons. Um, but since then, they've been at 97 to 98% occupancy on their portfolio. So really strong occupancy. This isn't a business that overnight things are going to turn downwards. You even see in 2020, given what happened there, occupancy was still in the mid to high 90s. So really high quality um, occupancy. And that's because the tenants that they have are very large companies that even in a downturn, don't want to give up their space and in defensive categories that even in a downturn, their businesses are still doing okay. If we look at what their estimates are, they're expected to do about a buck 80 of uh, funds from operations, which is equivalent to earnings per share for REITs. So at a $17 price, this company's trading at about nine times, nine and a half times earnings for this year here, which I think is a great value given the quality of the assets that they hold. They also, in addition to trading at under 10 times earnings, are investing a ton in growth, development pipeline of over $400 million on the year. Looking at the total market cap here, their total market cap is about $5 billion. So that means that they're investing um, almost 10% of their market value in growth. That's a huge investment for them to be making. Looking at how they uh, plan on delivering value to shareholder over the next few years, you see they were planning on having a 4 to 5% dividend yield. The stock's gone down so much that they're actually at almost a 65 So you're getting in um, significantly cheaper than what this projection was. And on top of the dividend yield, they're planning to grow their funds from operations through development and just organic growth, given where their buildings are situated, to have a total return of 10 to 12%. If they can actually deliver the FFO growth with the dividend that they're at and the price that they're at, this would actually be closer to 15% at today's stock prices. So if they can actually execute on this and deliver that, that's really strong uh, returns for shareholders. One of the things that they've been investing a lot in is residential rental. So it's only, I think about three, 4% of the business today, um, but this is an area that has much higher FFO multiples in the market. Think a company like Capri trades at about 20 times, 19 times. So every year they've been bringing a couple new buildings online and they continue to develop more and more in the residential space. You can see here almost half of their development pipeline is residential rental compared to 14% on retail compared to 2% on office. So you can see they're really skewing towards wanting more and more exposure to residential rental. I think they wanted about five to 10% of their total um, rental revenue coming from residential over the next handful of years. So while it will not, will not be like the core part of the business, it'll be a really nice 
mix and really, um, really uh, sustained or, or less volatile part of the business. Not to say that their retail portfolio is volatile, but overall residential tends to have lower, um, lower turn, higher occupancy that then retail in, in bad times. So that's an interesting investment and, and pivot that the company's uh, making to make sure their portfolio is conservative. One of the things that people kind of say about retail and mo mostly coming over from the US in terms of the rhetoric is how retail is overbuilt, retail is dying. Um, there's huge malls and random cities in the US that are completely empty. That's just not the case to the same extent in Canada. You can see the amount of square foot per person is almost 40% higher in the US than Canada. So just the supply and the d demand dynamics overall is not the same. In addition to that, from a population growth standpoint, you see Canada's population growth is set to be about three times that of the United States. So in a world where retail is not really getting built out very much um, and, and it's mostly a developed sector, uh, that population growth will continue to increase or sorry, decrease the amount of square foot per customer. And these new people coming to the country still need essential services, still need to buy their groceries. So you think the demand for these spaces over time, if anything, given the tenants they work with, may go up, not down. And another thing just to, to share about their portfolio here, is they actually have the most square feet in uh, the downtown core of Toronto. And lots of these assets flagship assets, really hard to replace, extremely expensive. Um, you will never be able to buy these assets with tenants in them trading at nine times earnings like the holding company of Rio Can is currently trading. They're all over kind of the center of Toronto, down here on the west side of Toronto and also a lot of presence on the east side. So they're well covered on subway lines. They have some flagship assets that are really like irreplaceable in the city. I'm um, just trading at overall, when you look at Rio Can as a whole, dirt cheap valuations. Lastly here, just how they allocate their capital. I've, I've been looking at this company for a while. They're really good at allocating capital, it seems. You see here, they have about $500 million funds from operation. So immediately with that money, they're paying um, about 60% of it out in distributions, about $100 million in, in CapEx out. And they're also self-funding lots of the development spend that they're doing. Um, in addition to that, they do do some residential inventory gains. So they build condos as well on some of their land and take that money that they sell it for to invest in uh, their development program. And then through capital recycling. So they're disposing of assets that are in um, unideal locations or non-core locations. And they're really putting that money to unit buybacks. And I love to see a company that's doing unit buybacks when their stocks at this kind of discount versus their net asset values. Um, they're doing acquisitions in strategic areas, and they're also um, investing more working capital into the business. So they're, they're really taking money from operations as well as um, dispositions of non-core assets and some very small um, retail, uh, not retail, residential gains from condo sales and townhouse sales and paying, making sure that the shareholder is getting paid their dividend um, making sure they're future-proofing their business with huge development spend and also um, strategically doing acquisitions and buybacks where it makes sense. So really like just how they're managing the business to serve uh, shareholders today, but also ensure they have a growth pipeline for tomorrow as well. And overall here, you'll see on their earnings per share, right in line with their funds from operation for the most part, about $1.80. So these are now two companies that have a forward um, earnings potential of um, or forward price to earnings of under 10 times earnings for companies that I both see having long-term growth opportunities in the Canadian market. So I know both these companies are kind of hit down right now because of interest rates being high. They both require lots of debt just to service their, their existing business. And I think that's why they've gotten hit down to this extent. But long-term, I think they're really well positioned. Even in this high interest rate environment, they're providing tons of incremental cash flows they have opportunities to pay down debt if they want to. And I think they'll weather these storms and they'll come out stronger on the other end. So I'm loving the opportunity to buy in here at under 10 times earnings on both Rogers and Rio Can. I'll continue to monitor these for future buys in the coming months and year, depending on where the stock price goes and where their debt positions and, and earnings come in. But I just wanted to share with you um, these two buys that I have made here today in my portfolio. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this kind of content, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. 
really does help with the YouTube algorithm. And if you made it all the way to the end, be sure to let me know in the comments. Would love to hear your thoughts on either of these stocks or just drop a high in the comments as well. Would love to meet more of you guys and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.